OK, so in the last class we had looked at the AC circuits. And we had looked at complex notation as well as phasor representation of AC quantities. We'll take up a few more circuits and then we'll slowly go over as to how to apply the various theorems. What we had already studied network theorems like Thevenin's, Norton's maximum power transfer theorem. All of them, whether they can be applied, they should be. We should be in a position to apply them for uh, the AC circuits as well. So we'll try to look at a couple of them probably and then we'll go over to the next topic which is known as resonance. OK, so that's what I'm planning to do today. We'll start with uh, a couple of problems in the AC uh, circuit. So the first problem that I'm going to take up. I'm just going to take up one example problem so that we know how to solve really an AC circuit which is a little complex, more complex than what we saw until now. So let's say I am going to have a source like this, which is having 49.2 volts. OK, most of the times when you are given an AC voltage, unless it is given like some X sine omega T, the value X in that particular expression indicates the peak value. Otherwise, if it is given only 49.2, something like this, generally it indicates RMS value. All the AC supply voltage, what we see, for example, in USA it is 110 volts. In India it is 230 volts. All of them indicate the RMS value, not the peak value. So if you want really to know uh, whether you will be able to use a particular device or use a particular appliance which can withstand, you know, the peak value. You have to multiply this 230 by root 2 and find out whether your device will be in a position to handle that or not. OK, so 230 is the RMS value, whereas 230 times root 2, which is 325. OK, see it is like etched in my memory because we keep using it all the time. So 325 happens to be the peak value as far as the sinusoidal voltage that we use in India is concerned. OK, and generally the single phase voltage has a range. It is from 220 to 240. It is supposed to remain between 220 to 240 normally. But sometimes of course there is sag in voltage. Our power system is constantly improving, but nevertheless you can see sometimes some sag in the voltage from 230. It might come down to 190 or 180 very rarely. OK, OK, so let us start with the circuit. So the circuit is somewhat like this. You have a source which is 49.2 uh, volts. Then you have an R and L and R is 8 ohms and XL what is given is 6 ohms. Then you have one capacitance. And one more resistance. OK, this resistance is again 8 ohms. And this particular current is specified as I2. And this current is specified as I1. OK, and that's it. This is a small circuit. It is really not a very complex circuit, but nevertheless just to demonstrate how to solve AC circuits. Just showing this. Otherwise you can use mesh current analysis, nodal analysis, everything you can use in AC circuits as well. But it is going to be definitely very complex because you know matrix inversion naturally even in your uh, normal numbers, it's not a very simple thing. Here it is even more so. So it's not going to be very easy. That's the reason. So this is the net network and what is being asked is determine I1 and I2 in this circuit. So you are being asked to determine what is I1 and I2. So let's see how to do this. Let me call this as Z1. And let me call this impedance parallel combination of the capacitance and this as Z2. Capacitance value is given as 16 ohms. Xc equal to 16 ohms. Okay. 
So uh, let us first of all try to simplify this network. I'm not using mesh analysis or nodal analysis or anything. Directly I'm trying to simplify this series parallel combination using that. So let's try to do that. So what is Z1? Can you tell me what is Z1 here? So it is a squ 8 square plus 6 square square root, right? So either you can write 10 angle whatever, or you can write simply 8 plus J6. That is also fine. Please write it in rectangular form or polar form. Rectangular form is much simpler. Polar form, if you have to calculate, please make sure you don't make the mistake. Make any mistake when you are writing that. OK, so this is Z1. Now what is Z2? What is Z2? It is JXC in parallel with 8 ohms. Am I right? It is minus JXC. Please correct me. If I am making a mistake, don't keep quiet. It is minus JXC. Capacitive reactance is always minus J. Okay? So I have to write this as minus J16 multiplied by 8 divided by 8 minus J16. Am I right? It is very similar to what you do for resistance in parallel. The same thing you have to do. OK, fine. So what do we do now? How do we figure out what we should do here? So this is 128 minus J. 816s are 128. And this is 8 plus J16, 8 minus J16, which you can write in terms of polar form. Please remember every time you are going to divide something, it is always multiplication or division. You have to do it in polar form. Whenever you do the addition, it is in rectangular form. Understand? For all the addition and subtraction, use rectangular form. For all the multiplication and division, use the polar form. That is the simplest. OK, so. I have to write 8 square plus 16 square square root. And angle tan inverse of 16 divided by 8, so minus 2. Right, I can write like this. Is that fine? So you have the calculator. Please tell me the values. So this is going to be I can write this as 128 angle minus 90. Please understand J is plus 90 minus J is minus 90. So I can write this like 128 angle minus 90. What is 8 square plus 16 square square root? Hmm? 17.5. 17 something. So 17.89. That's what I am having. I don't know. You have to check. And this angle happens to be minus 63 something. 63.43. OK, so all these things are of course in terms of ohms. No doubt. Now. 128 divided by 17.89. I think we are getting 7.15. OK, so now this is 90. Minus 90 plus 63.43. So I'm going to have minus 20 something, right? 20, 23, 24, how much? 26, 26.56. So this is going to be minus 26.56 degrees. Fine. So if I want, I can write it in again, rectangular form. So I think this happens to be something like 6.4 minus J 3.2. This is the value we are getting as far as Z2 is concerned. So Z1 and Z2 we have got. Now what we have to write is the overall Z1 plus Z2. How much? Because now this entire R and L is coming in series with the parallel combination of these two. Right? And we have got already what is the parallel combination of these two. So we are going to have 8 plus J6, right? Plus 6.4 minus J3.2. 
So 8 plus 6, 14. So I'm going to have 14.4 plus J6 minus 3.2, 2.8, right? So J 2.8 ohms. So I can again, if I want to know the current, I have to first of all divide this 49.42 volts, 49.2 volts by this particular complex number. So when you do the division, it's always easier to have it in polar form. So 14.4 whole square plus 2.8 whole square, square root of that, right? So that happens to be 14.67. Check it out, 14.67 and angle is 11 degrees. Okay, this is what I'm getting as the impedance, which is Z1 plus Z2. So what is the current? current I1, which is the source current, that is going to be equal to 49.2 divided by 14.67 angle 11. In case they are asking about the imaginary part and real part or only the magnitude, depending upon what is being asked, you will need this angle, otherwise you don't need the angle. Doesn't matter, so I am writing the angle as well for the sake of completeness. So 49.2 divided by 14.67, that is the current magnitude. How much is it? That is coming out to be 3.354 ampere. With a phase angle of minus 11 degrees. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Is this clear? Okay. Now I have to get what is the value of the current that is flowing only through the 8 ohm resistance. So this I1 is dividing itself into, if I may call this as IC and I2. So I should say I1 is dividing itself into two portions. One is IC, whatever is the capacitance current. The other one is I2. So again, to calculate I2, I can say whatever is the other impedance, the impedance in the other branch divided by the sum of the two impedance, current division rule, normal current division rule. So I can simply say minus J16 will come on the top, right? And at the bottom, what is going to come? 8 minus J16, right? multiplied by 3.354 ampere. If I am talking about only magnitude, I can simply take without the angle, just the magnitude alone. So this is going to be again, minus J16 divided by, what was the value we got? 17.89, whatever. Angle minus 63.43. That's what we wrote earlier. I'm just copying that here. Okay, multiplied by 3.354. When you calculate, you are getting something like 3.000 or 2.9999, something we are getting. So this is 3 ampere. So this is going to be 3 ampere. So this is exactly similar to what we did in the case of DC circuits as well. Only thing is the calculation is a little bit more involved because of complex number calculations. Nothing else more than that. Okay, is this clear? So if I have to do Thevenin's theorem, if I have to do Norton's theorem, if I have to do mesh current analysis, if I have to do nodal analysis, everything can be done the same way like what we did in the case of DC circuit. There is no doubt. Only thing is calculations will be really a big headache because it is all complex number calculation. And I think you guys should learn how to use the calculator for getting complex polar to rectangular and rectangular to polar conversion. Okay, so just one quick thing is maximum power transfer theorem, what we studied for DC circuit, it's a little different for AC circuit. So I'm going to look at maximum power transfer theorem or condition for AC circuits. So we are going to look at maximum power transfer condition for AC circuit. So as a rule, if you are going to have an AC supply, 
none of the supplies what we have in actual practice in real life or pure voltage sources or they are not going to be completely ideal voltage sources the name ideal itself says it is not realistic okay so any source that you have if i am going to have an ac source v it will always have inherently some amount of r and x maybe capacitance also but most of the times you will see that the ac sources come along with some r and some x okay but if i am going to have a load again i'm going to say some r and some x i'm showing them like this i'm not showing whether it is capacitance or inductance so i call this as rl and i'm going to call this as xl okay so under what situation we are going to have maximum transfer of power in this particular network what kind of relationship we should have between r and rl this we had already seen in dc network we said if r equal to rl then maximum amount of power transfer occurs right this is what we saw already in dc circuit so this we saw in dc circuit whereas in ac circuit when are we going to really have maximum amount of power being transferred to the load side so let us first of all write what is the current in this network if i try to write what is the current in this network i should say i will be equal to v divided by the magnitude of the impedance so the magnitude of the impedance i should write as r plus rl the whole square plus x plus xl x plus xl the whole square right and square root of that that is going to give me the current so if i say power transferred to rl because please remember this is not an external resistance that i am adding this is already there and it is unwanted addition i don't want it but it is there i can't help it whereas this is the one to which i might like to transfer the power it may be a heater it may be an iron box it may be any kind of bulb probably so i want to transfer some power to the load okay so power transferred to rl if i have to write i should say this is p okay that is going to be i square multiplied by rl so i square i should write this as v square divided by r plus rl the whole square plus x plus xl the whole square right this is i square multiplied by rl so i can do the same thing like what i did earlier under what condition of xl i'm going to get maximum power so i can say dp divided by dxl i want to equate this to 0 to find out what is the value of xl under which this will happen okay so tell me when you do the differentiation so v square rl will come as it is and x plus xl the whole square that is the only thing that i need to differentiate so that will be minus 2 multiplied by x plus xn right so this should be equal to 0 so which means i'm going to have x equal to minus xl when i'm going to have the load impedance or the loads reactance portion exactly equal but opposite in terms of sign then i will have the maximum current that is being passed through this circuit and i'm going to have definitely highest amount of power delivered to the resistance the load resistance so i should say basically r l plus j x l should be equal to actually r plus 
rather minus of j x s. The source impedance minus j x. So if this is the way it is, I'm going to get maximum power transfer possible from the source into the resistance component. OK, instead of iron box or instead of anything, if I have a motor. Right, please understand motor is made to rotate, so that is also really transferring energy from the source in the form of a mechanical power. It is manifested in the form of rotational mechanical power. OK, so there also you will have equivalent resistance and so on. So torque multiplied by omega probably you will take as the overall power which can be manifested in the form of equivalent resistance. OK, so any of these things can be represented by an equivalent resistance. So we will essentially equate the energy. That's it or power that is being, you know, manifested in the form of heat or manifested in the form of rotational energy or whatever. OK, so you can say that if. The load impedance. Is the complex conjugate. Conjugate. Of. The source impedance. Then maximum. Power transfer. Occurs. So we have something called filters in many of our uh, communication circuits, especially because we might like to. Uh, you guys must have definitely uh, uh, looked at old time radios. I don't know whether you guys have ever looked at the uh, so called transistor radio from which we used to listen to in those days. We never had anything called FM. All of them were AM and amplitude modulation. We used to listen to music and things like that from our uh, transistor radio or something like that. So in that you will normally tune yourself to a particular station, right? So that is essentially done by adjusting the capacitance and inductance which will be sitting inside your device and that will be adjusted such that it is exactly tuned to another frequency which is the broadcasting frequency of the radio station. AM station or FM station. So basically the filter is a device which will allow passage of certain frequencies only and it will not allow rest of the frequencies to be passed on. So let us say I have an input. Maybe I am going to have an input from here and I'm going to put a filter circuit here. The filter circuit will allow only some of the frequencies from the input voltage to be passed on to the output side. So I will not be able to pass on everything. It is like a regular filter what you have for water. So water filter make sure that only the pure water comes out. Rest of impurities and everything stay back, right? That is what happens. The same thing is done using a filter. So the filter can be very, very effectively designed by having a resistance and inductance or resistance and capacitance. For example, if I am going to have a resistance. Right, and let's say I put an inductance in series with that and I call that V in is actually passing through this particular circuit. So this is having R and this is actually J omega L. All of you know that this is the impedance of the inductance. OK, so if I want a good portion of the voltage to be passed down to the output on this side, if I am going to have a high frequency component, let us say this voltage consists of various frequency components. Maybe it has 50 hertz, 60 hertz, 1.5 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz. Maybe it has more and more higher order frequency. And what I want is only the higher order frequency. I don't want the lower order frequencies at all to be passed on for whatever reason. In which case, if I have a circuit like this, this J omega L is going to increase as omega increases. If the frequency which is being input to the circuit, if that is increasing, this is going to essentially show more and more impedance. 
So by the voltage division rule, this will actually take the lion's share of the high frequency component, whereas this will not have much of the high frequency components at all. So this will essentially allow all the high frequency components to be passed on to the output side. So this is passing all the high frequency component. So we call this as a high pass filter. We call this as a high pass filter. A high pass filter is you are going to have a resistance and inductance in series and across the inductance you are going to tap the output. Okay, and the inductance manifests itself as a high impedance basically for very high frequencies. So most of the high frequency components will be completely taken away by the inductance and passed down to the output side. So this is a typical high pass filter. On the other hand, if rather I put a capacitance here and a resistance here, what will happen in this case, particular case? What is going to happen in this particular case? This is going to be minus J divided by omega C. Right? So whenever I'm talking about DC, this will work as a open circuit. This is going to op operate as an open circuit, right? So whenever I'm talking about DC, it will block all the DC. Whereas whenever I'm talking about a high frequency component, this is going to essentially allow it to pass through very, very easy. Understand because if I'm talking about 10 kilohertz, one divided by two pi 10,000 multiplied by the capacitance. That is going to be the impedance manifested by this particular capacitance. So it is going to manifest a very, very small amount of impedance. So very easily the voltage will pass through if it is of 10 kilohertz frequency. So this is going to offer very, very low impedance. So this will be low impedance to high frequency components. Because of which, again, most of the high frequency component will come through this resistance because this is essentially having very low impedance. So most of the voltage will be taken away by this particular resistance. So this kind of circuit will also work like a high pass filter. So a high pass filter can be designed with R and L or R and C. But only thing is in the input side, which one are you putting? Whether you are putting, placing the capacitor on the input side or whether you are placing the inductor on the input side. That is going to matter whether you are designing a high pass filter properly or not. Got it? Similarly, we can do low pass filter. So in the case of low pass filter, we want to pass on the low frequency components. We don't want to pass on the high frequency components. We want to always pass on the low frequency components. So if I want to pass on the low frequency component, I can just have the reverse of this. So what I should do is I should have a resistance and a capacitance like this. Right? Because the capacitance will have lion's share of the voltage taken away by itself because I'm going to have this to be minus J by omega C and this is going to be R. So here I will have in the output all the low frequency components. So low frequency components will be passed on to the output side from the input. Most of the waves we see actually in communication will have several frequency components uh, you know, existing together. Only in power you will not see that because we deliberately generate 50 hertz electricity. That is the reason why you don't see different frequency components. Okay, but normally in all the communication signals, you will see multiple frequency components. So you might have to choose and pick and choose what frequency component you want to pass on. So that is the reason why these filters really come in handy. Okay. So in this particular case, again, compared to the resistance, 
the capacitance will manifest a very very large impedance for low frequency components so the output will have all the low frequency components coming out so similarly i should be able to actually make with inductance and resistance a low pass filter okay so this inductance will behave literally like a short circuit for any dc right so it is going to behave like a short circuit similarly for low frequency component it is going to manifest only a very very small magnitude of impedance so compared to that most of the voltage will come here so here again v out will have mostly all the low frequency components of input if i am talking about this as v in then my v out is going to have most of the low frequency components coming out in the form of v out okay so these are really important circuits we which you will be using eventually especially to design various types of filters which are used extensively in communication applications okay so now we are going to slowly migrate to something called resonance so for this first of all i'm going to take uh, one example problem and then we are going to slowly move towards resonance so again i'm going to take 100 volts 50 hertz source okay 100 volts is rms okay now i am going to take a resistance of 5 ohm i am going to take one inductance and a capacitance okay so let me look at the values what i had already zeroed in on so this is 318.5 milli henry i am taking specifically a particular value the other one i am taking is 31.85 microfarad okay so now i want you to calculate what is the value of 2 pi fl which is omega l 2 pi f is 314 or 314.28 whatever multiplied by because 2 pi is uh 2 2 f is 100 100 multiplied by pi okay so that is 314.28 multiplied by 318.5 multiplied by 10 power minus 3 so simultaneously i'm writing for capacitive reactants also so this is xl and this is going to be xc magnitude wise both of them yeah 2 pi f 2 multiplied by f is 50 hertz i have written 50 hertz here so 100 100 multiplied by 3.1428 right so this is going to be 1 by 314.28 multiplied by 31.85 multiplied by 10 power minus 6 i think both of them should work out to be 100 ohms roughly okay is that fine so this will be 100 ohms this will also be 100 ohms okay so when i write the total impedance which is actually going to be equal to r plus j xl minus j xc that is going to be the total impedance right so i'm going to get essentially r plus j 100 Minus J hundred, so I'm going to have only R, and that R value here is five ohms. This happens to be five ohms. Okay, so if I try to calculate what is the current, what is the current through this, I'm going to have hundred divided by five ohm, which is going to be twenty ampere. and this 20 ampere will be in phase with the voltage i hope you understand because it is a resistive circuit now although there is capacitance and inductance 
the two reactances essentially cancel out each other so it is behaving purely like a resistive circuit right so if i try to draw what is the kind of voltage i'm having if i say this is 100 volts and if i am trying to draw what is the current i am having i am going to have a current like this which are in phase with each other voltage and current are in phase with each other right so i am drawing this with respect to time or omega t either way is fine okay now if i try to look at what is the kind of voltage i have across this and what is the kind of voltage i have across this across the capacitance and across the inductance i cannot say both of them are zero they are cancelling out with each other probably but they are not going to be zero so let me first of all draw the phasor diagram corresponding to this let's say this is my current okay and i'm going to have ir which is the voltage that is also here so this is i times r and this is going to be i both of them are in phase with each other whereas if i look at what is the voltage across the inductance that is going to lead the current by 90 degrees and the voltage across the capacitance is going to lag the current by 90 degrees so they will be exactly opposite each other as far as the vectorial uh, representation is concerned right so i'm going to have this is the direction of the voltage if i say of the inductance but i r i said is 100 volts right but if i try to calculate what is the voltage across the inductance so i should say j omega l multiplied by i if i want to know only the magnitude i can remove this j i can simply get what is the magnitude of omega l i that's it so that is going to be essentially 100 ohms multiplied by 20 ampere so i'm going to have please note this is 2000 volts what i applied was only 100 volts and 2000 volts will come across the inductance okay so i'm going to have a huge amount of voltage if i have to draw it to scale compared to this i have to draw this 20 times so i have to really draw a very long vector okay so i am going to draw this somewhat like this i am not really drawing it 20 times but i am saying that this is going to be really really long this is going to be really really long and this is going to be 2000 volts which is actually omega l i similarly i am going to have if i try to look at the capacitance voltage it will also be too long like this exactly 180 degrees opposite to the previous one and this is going to be the voltage across the capacitance which is going to be again 2000 volts so if i exactly write this i should write this as j 2000 uh minus j 2000 and this will be plus j 2000 so under resonance condition the individual voltages what i see across the capacitance and inductance can be way too high compared to what i get only across the source i may think that i am supplying only 100 volts but i'll get a huge amplification of that voltage across the resistance and inductance and that is again used extensively in radio frequency circuits because where you want to amplify the voltages you can use resonant condition and you would be able to amplify the voltage only across one component if you want that is possible okay so under resonant condition basically what happens is what happens is you are going to have the impedance offered by the inductance and the impedance offered by the capacitance both of them essentially cancel out each other because of which the current you get is going to be only resistive which means it is going to be basically in phase with the voltage it cannot have any phase shift with respect to voltage so what is going to happen is you can say 2 pi f l if i say f not is the resonant frequency 2 pi f not l e is going to be equal to 1 by 2 pi f not c in terms of magnitude so because of which i should be able to write this as f not square equal to 1 divided by 2 pi 
multiplied by 2 pi multiplied by LC. So this I'm sure you guys must have studied earlier. I'm just reiterating it. This is the resonant frequency is given by 1 by 2 pi root LC. So if I have L and C as the components of my series resonant circuit, I have connected R, L, C in series. So whenever I'm talking about series resonant circuit at resonant frequency, it is going to give really, really minimum impedance. And that minimum impedance will be equal to the resistance component what I have in the circuit itself. So again, this resonance is generally used for filtering action very often. So if I want to bypass maybe certain high frequency components elsewhere, or if I want to bypass specifically a particular frequency component, what I can do is to choose L and C values in such a way that it is tuned to that particular frequency. So what will happen is it will offer minimum impedance for that particular frequency component. So everything will be bypassed. What I mean is, let us say I have a voltage source. Which is having 50 Hertz component. Maybe it has uh, say um, fifth harmonic, which is 250 Hertz component. And let us say I have 350 Hertz component. So many of them are there. OK, and I want to ultimately give this voltage to let us say my motor. Maybe I have a pumping motor at home, so I'm going to have a motor. I want to give only 50 Hertz component to this motor. I don't want to give 350 or 250 Hertz because my motor will start growing. Normally, you don't want to give any higher harmonic component to your motor because it will start making huge amount of noise. So you want to make sure that motor also I should show grounding. You cannot show any electrical apparatus without grounding. So if I want only 50 Hertz to go, then what I should do is I should include one circuit. I don't even need the resistance but that is a necessary evil that comes along with the inductance because inductance is made up of copper coil. Along with the copper coil, there will be some resistance. You can't help it. So you are going to have inductance and you are going to have capacitance designed in such a way that I'm going to do 1 by 2 pi root LC. If I call this as L1 and or L5 and C5 because this is the fifth harmonic component. I can say 1 by 2 pi root L5 C5 should be equal to 250 Hertz. Similarly, I may have one more circuit which actually I'm going to connect it in such a way that I'm going to have L7 and C7. I am essentially going to connect externally a circuit so that this is going to bypass all the 250 Hertz component and this is going to bypass all the 350 Hertz component so that only the 50 Hertz component goes here. So I am bypassing unwanted components by providing a very low impedance circuit. The low impedance is because of the resonance. So I'm going to design my L5 C5 in such a way that it is exactly having the resonant frequency of 250 Hertz. Similarly, I'm going to have 1 by 2 pi root of L7 C7, which is going to be equal to 350 Hertz. So I will connect two such filters to filter out fifth harmonic and seventh harmonic. Obviously, the voltage that is coming across L5 and C5 could be pretty large. So this sometimes results in the failure of the capacitance and inductance. So when we do the design, we have to be very, very careful to see what kind of voltages are, what kind of amplification these filters are going to do. We have to be really careful about that. That is the reason, although we call this resistance as a necessary evil, it also limits the current. See, in this particular problem, what we did, we said that 100 divided by 5, that 5 ohm resistance was limiting the current, what is flowing. So otherwise the current would have been much higher. The current was 20 amperes only because of the resistance. So although the resistance is a necessary evil, it also limits the amount of current that is, that is flowing through the circuit. 
So incidentally, it also limits the voltage that is manifested across the capacitance as well as across the reactants. That is the major advantage of having a little larger resistance. But generally, there will be something called, we call something as quality factor. So the quality factor is quality factor of an inductive coil he is actually defined as omega not l omega not is corresponding to resonant frequency divided by r so quality factor basically is going to give you what is the fraction of inductive voltage drop versus what is the fraction of resistance drop at resonant condition basically okay it is also indirectly going to tell you how much is the maximum energy stored in the inductance at resonant frequency of course okay to the ratio is maximum energy stored in the inductance and energy dissipated in the resistance. The resistance is associated with the inductive coil itself. So I cannot really segregate. Okay. Very often if I take an inductive coil, it will manifest an inductance L, which may be in Henry, Henry or Milli Henry. But along with that, it will also have an inherent resistance. So the quality factor essentially tells me what is the amount of maximum energy stored in the inductance divided by energy dissipated in the resistance per cycle. Per cycle. OK, so this generally is written as Q. So maximum energy stored in the inductance is all of you know half L I square. So this is going to be half L I max square. The maximum current that is flowing through the inductance. Right and energy dissipated in the resistance per cycle. If I write, I should write I RMS square multiplied by R. That is the power dissipated and I have to multiply this by one time period. One time period is capital T. Right. So instead of writing T, I can write this as 1 by F. Can I write it as 1 by F? Right? I should be able to write this as 1 by F. Right? So if I write this as 1 by F, uh, 2 pi F is omega. Right? So I can write 1 by F is equal to 2 pi by omega. So I can write this as 2 pi by omega. So half L I max square divided by I RMS square multiplied by R multiplied by 2 pi by omega. Right? So now if I try to look at it, uh, I max divided by 2 is I, I max divided by root 2 times root 2, I can say. So I max divided by root 2 is I RMS. So I should say this and this will get cancelled. I can write this as I max by root 2 multiplied by I max by root 2, which is actually I RMS itself, right? And in the denominator, I already have I RMS square. And I have R. R is coming at the bottom, fine. And I'm going to have 2 pi by omega. So I should have omega L here. Ultimately, we should get the quality factor you can define as the energy, maximum energy stored in the inductance by energy dissipated in the resistance per cycle, associated resistance per cycle. So Quality factor is generally the definition is either the voltage drop across the inductance to the voltage drop across the resistance at resonant frequency or it can be defined as basically, uh, you know, uh, the energy stored in the inductance, the maximum energy stored in the inductance to how much is the energy dissipated in the resistance per cycle. So 
quality factor basically talks about your quality of inductance to store energy how much it will be able to store the energy vis a vis how much it is wasting the energy okay so we will look at the resonant of resonant condition further in terms of really what is the application of resonance 